Chapter Four, Part Two of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. New Friends, Part Two. That night, Shefford lay in his blankets out under the open sky and the stars. The earth had never meant much to him, and now it was a bed. He had preached of the heavens, but until now he had never studied them. An Indian slept beside him, and not until the gray of morning had blotted out the starlight did Shefford close his eyes. With the break of the next day came full, varied, and stirring incidents to Shefford. He was strong, though unskilled, at most kinds of outdoor tasks. Withers had worked for ten men, if they could have been found. Shefford dug and packed and lifted till he was so sore and tired that rest was a blessing. He never succeeded in getting on a friendly footing with the Mormon Wisner, though he kept up his agreeable and kindly advances. He listened to the trader's wife as she told him about the Indians, and what he learned he did not forget, and his wonder and respect increased in proportion to his knowledge. One day there rode into Kayenta the Mormon for whom Withers had been waiting. His name was Joe Lake. He appeared young and slipped off his superb bay with a grace and activity that were astounding in one of his huge bulk. He had a still, smooth face with the color of red bronze and the expression of a cherub, big, soft, dark eyes, and a winning smile. He was surprisingly different from Wisner or any Mormon character that Shefford had naturally conceived. His costume was that of a cowboy on active service, and he packed a gun at his hip. The handshake he gave Shefford was an ordeal for that young man, and left him with his whole right side momentarily benumbed. "'I'm sure glad to meet you,' he said in a lazy, mild voice, and he was taken friendly stock of Shefford when the bay mustang reached with vicious muzzle to bite at him. Lake gave a jerk on the bridle that almost brought the mustang to his knees. He reared then, snorted, and came down to plant his forefeet wide apart, and watched his master with defiant eyes. The Mustang was the finest horse Shefford had ever seen. He appeared quite large for his species, and was almost red in color, and had a racy and powerful build, and a fine thoroughbred head with dark, fiery eyes. He did not look mean, but he had spirit. Navvy, you sure got bad manners, said Lake, shaking the Mustang's bridle. He spoke as if he were chiding a refractory little boy. Didn't I break you better than that? What's this gentleman going to think of you, trying to bite my ear off? Lake had arrived about the middle of the forenoon, and Withers announced his intention of packing at once for the trip. Indians were sent out on the range to drive in burros and mustangs. Shefford had his thrilling expectancy somewhat chilled by what he considered must have been Lake's reception of the trader's plan. Lake seemed to oppose him, and evidently it took vehemence and argument on Withers' part to make the Mormon tractable. But Withers won him over, and then he called Shefford to his side. "'You fellows got to be good friends,' he said. "'You'll have charge of my pack trains. Nas de Vega wants to go with you. I'll feel safer about my supplies and stock than I've ever been. Joe, I'll back this stranger for all I'm worth. He's square. And, Shefford, Joe Lake is a Mormon of the younger generation. I want you to start right. You can trust him as you trust me. He's white clean through, and he's the best horse wrangler in Utah. It was Lake who first offered his hand, and Shefford made haste to meet it with his own. Neither of them spoke. Shefford intuitively felt an alteration in Lake's regard, or at least a singular increase of interest. Lake had been told that Shefford had been a clergyman, was now a wanderer without any religion. Again it seemed to Shefford that he owned a forming of friendship to this singular fact, and it hurt him. But strangely, it came to him that he had taken a liking to a Mormon. About one o'clock the pack train left Cayenta. 
Nas Te Bega led the way up the slope. Following him climbed half a dozen patient, plodding, heavily laden burrows. Withers came next, and he turned in his saddle to wave goodbye to his wife. Joe Lake appeared to be busy keeping a red mule and a wild gray mustang and a couple of restive blacks in the trail. Shefford brought up in the rear. He was mounted on a beautiful black mustang with three white feet, a white spot on his nose, and a mane that swept to his knees. His name's Nack Yaw, Withers had said. It means two bits or twenty-five cents. He ain't worth more. To look at Nack Yaw had pleased Shefford very much indeed, but once upon his back he grew dubious. The Mustang acted queer. He actually looked back at Shefford, and it was a look of speculation and disdain. Shefford took exception to Nack Yaw's manner and to his reluctance to go, and especially to a habit that the Mustang had of turning off the trail to the left. Shefford had managed some rather spirited horses back in Illinois, and though he was willing and eager to learn all over again, he did not enjoy the prospect of Lake and Withers seeing this black Mustang make a novice of him. And he guessed that was just what Nack Yaw intended to do. However, once up over the hill, with Kayenta out of sight, Nack Yaw trotted along fairly well, needing only now and then to be pulled back from his strange swinging to the left off the trail. The pack train traveled steadily and soon crossed the upland plain to descend into the valley again. Shefford saw the jagged red peaks with an emotion he could not name. The canyon between them were purple in the shadows. The great walls and slopes brightened to red, and the tips were gold in the sun. Shefford forgot all about his mustang and the trail. Suddenly, with a pound of hoofs, Nack Yaw seemed to rise. He leaped sideways out of the trail, came down stiff-legged. Then Shefford shot out of the saddle. He landed so hard that he was stunned for an instant. Sitting up, he saw the Mustang bent down, eyes and ears showing fight, and his four feet spread. He appeared to be looking at something in the trail. Shefford got up and soon saw what had been the trouble. A long, crooked stick, rather thick and black and yellow, lay in the trail, and any Mustang looking for an excuse to jump might have mistaken it for a rattlesnake. Nack Yaw appeared disposed to be satisfied and gave Shefford no trouble in mounting. The incident increased Shefford's dubiousness. These Arizona Mustangs were unknown quantities. Thereafter, Shefford had an eye for the trail rather than the scenery, and this continued till the pack train entered the mouth of the Sagi. Then those wonderful lofty cliffs, with their peaks and towers and spires, loomed so close and so beautiful that he did not care if Nack Yaw did throw him. Along here, however, the Mustang behaved well, and presently Shefford decided that if it had been otherwise he would have walked. The trail suddenly stood on end and led down into the deep wash, where some days before he had seen the stream of reddish water. This day there appeared to be less water, and it was not so red. Nack Yaw sank deep, as he took short and careful steps down. The burros and other mustangs were drinking, and Nack Yaw followed suit. The Indian, with a hand clutching his mustang's mane, rode up a steep sandy slope on the other side that Shefford would not have believed any horse could climb. The burros plodded up and over the rim, with Withers calling to them. Joe Lake swung his rope and cracked the flanks of the gray mare, and the red mule, and the way the two kicked was a revelation and a warning to Shefford. When his turn came to climb the trail, he got off and walked, an action that Nack Yaw appeared fully to appreciate. From the head of this wash, the trail wound away up the widening canyon, through greasewood flats and over grassy levels and across sandy stretches. The looming walls made the valley look narrow, yet it must have been half a mile wide. The slopes under the cliffs 
were dotted with huge stones and cedar trees. There were deep indentations in the walls, running back to form Box Canyon, choked with green of cedar and spruce and pinyon. These notches haunted Shefford, and he was ever on the lookout for more of them. Withers came back to ride just in advance and began to talk. Reckon this saggy canyon is your deception pass, he said. It's sure a queer hole. I've been lost more than once, hunting mustangs in here. I've an idea Nestebega knows all this country. He just pointed out a cliff dwelling to me. See it? There, way up in that cave on the wall. Shefford saw a steep, rough slope leading up to a bulge of the cliff, and finally he made out strange little houses with dark, eye-like windows. He wanted to climb up there. Withers called his attention to more caves with what he believed were the ruins of cliff dwellings. As they rode along, the trader showed him remarkable formations of rock where the elements were slowly hollowing out a bridge. They came presently to a region of intersecting canyon, and here the breaking of the trail up and down the deep washes took Withers back to his task with the burrows and gave Shefford more concern than he liked with Nack Yaw. The Mustang grew unruly and was continually turning to the left. Sometimes he tried to climb the steep slope. He had to be pulled hard away from the opening canyon on the left. It seemed strange to Shefford that the Mustang never swerved to the right. This habit of Nack Yaw's and the increasing caution needed on the trail took all of Shefford's attention. When he dismounted, however, he had a chance to look around, and more and more he was amazed at the increasing proportions and wildness of the saggy. He came at length to a place where a fallen tree blocked the trail. All of the rest of the pack train had jumped the log, but Nack Yaw balked. Shefford dismounted, pulled the bridle over the mustang's head, and tried to lead him. Nack Yaw, however, refused to budge. Whereupon Shefford got a stick, and remounting, he gave the balky mustang a cut across the flank. Then something violent happened. Shefford received a sudden propelling jolt, and then he was rising into the air and then falling. Before he alighted, he had a clear image of Nack Yaw in the air above him, bent double, and seemingly possessed of devils. Then Shefford hit the ground with no light thud. He was thoroughly angry when he got dizzily upon his feet, but he was not quick enough to catch the mustang. Nack Yaw leaped easily over the log and went on ahead, dragging his bridle. Shefford hurried after him, and the faster he went, just by so much, the cunning Nack Yaw accelerated his gait. As the pack train was out of sight somewhere ahead, Shefford could not call to his companions to halt his mount, so he gave up trying, and walked on now with free and growing appreciation of his surroundings. The afternoon had waned. The sun blazed low in the west in a notch of the canyon ramparts, and one wall was darkening into purple shadow, while the other shone through a golden haze. It was a weird, wild world to Shefford, and every few strides he caught his breath and tried to realize actuality was not a dream. Nack Yaw kept about a hundred paces to the fore, and ever and anon he looked back to see how his new master was progressing. He varied these occasions by reaching down and nipping a tuft of grass. Evidently, he was too intelligent to go on fast enough to be caught by withers. Also, he kept continually looking up the slope to the left, as if seeking a way to climb out of the valley in that direction. Shefford thought it was well that the trail lay at the foot of a steep slope that ran up to unbroken bluffs. The sun set, and the canyon lost its red and its gold and deepened its purple. Shefford calculated he had walked five miles, and though he did not mind the effort, he would rather have ridden Nack Yaw into camp. He mounted a cedar ridge, crossed some sandy washes, turned a corner of bold wall to enter a wide green level. The mustangs were rolling and snorting. He heard the bray of a burrow. 
A bright blaze of campfire greeted him, and the dark figure of the Indian approached to intercept and catch Nack yal. When he stalked into camp, Withers wore a beaming smile, and Joe Lake, who was on his knees making biscuit dough in a pan, stopped proceedings and drawed, Reckon Nack yal bucked you off. Bucked? Was that it? Well, he separated himself from me in a new and somewhat painful manner to me. Sure I saw that in his eye, replied Lake, and Withers laughed with him. Nack yal never was well broke, he said, but he's a good mustang, nothing like Joe's Navy or that gray mayor dynamite. All this Indian stock will buck on a man once in a while. I'll take the bucking along with the rest, said Shefford. Both men liked his reply, and the Indian smiled for the first time. Soon they all sat around a spread tarpaulin and ate like wolves. After supper came the rest and talk before the campfire. Joe Lake was droll. He said the most serious things in a way to make Shefford wonder if he was not joking. Withers talked about the canyon, the Indians, the mustangs, the scorpions, running out of the heated sand. And the Shefford it was like a fascinating book. Nas Te Bega smoked in silence, his brooding eyes upon the fire. End of chapter four, part two. Live of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Trail. Shefford was awakened next morning by a sound he had never heard before, the plunging of hobbled horses on soft turf. It was clear daylight with a ruddy color in the sky and a tinge of red along the canyon rim. He saw Withers, Lake, and the Indian driving the Mustangs toward camp. The burros appeared lazy yet willing, but the Mustangs and the mule Withers called Red and the gray mare Dynamite were determined not to be driven into camp. It was astonishing how much action they had, how much ground they could cover with their forefeet hobbled together. They were exceedingly skillful. They lifted both forefeet at once and then plunged, and they all went in different directions. Nas Te Bega darted in here and there to head off escape. Shefford pulled on his boots and went out to help. He got too close to the gray mare, and warned by a yell from Withers, he jumped back just in time to avoid her vicious heels. Then Shefford turned his attention to Nack yal and chased him all over the flat in a futile effort to catch him. Nas Te Bega came to Shefford's assistance and put a rope over Nack yal's head. Don't ever get behind one of these mustangs, said Withers warningly. As Shefford came up, you might be killed. Eat your bite now. We'll soon be out of here. Shefford had been late in awakening. The others had breakfasted. He found eating somewhat difficult in the excitement that ensued. Nas Te Bega held ropes which were round the necks of red and dynamite. The mule showed his cunning and always appeared to present his heels to Withers, who tried to approach him with a pack saddle. The patience of the trader was a revelation to Shefford, and at length Red was cornered by the three men, the pack saddle was strapped on, and then the packs. Red promptly bucked the packs off, and the work had to be done over again. Then Red dropped his long ears and seemed ready to be tractable. When Shefford turned his attention to dynamite, he decided that this was his first sight of a wild horse. The gray mare had fiery eyes that rolled and showed the white. She jumped straight up, screamed, pawed, bit, and then plunged down to shoot her hind hoofs into the air as high as her head had been. She was amazingly agile, and she seemed mad to kill something. She dragged the Indian about, and when Joe Lake got a rope on her hind foot, she dragged them both. They lashed her with the ends of the lassos, which action only made her kick harder. She plunged into camp, drove Shefford flying for his life, knocked down two of the burrows, and played havoc with the unstrapped packs. 
Withers ran to the assistance of Lake, and the two of them hauled back with all their strength and weight. They were both powerful and heavy men. Dynamite circled round, and finally, after kicking the campfire to bits, fell down on her haunches in the hot embers. Let her set there, panted Withers, and Joe Lake shouted, Burn up, you darn coyote. Both men appeared delighted that she had brought upon herself just punishment. Dynamite sat in the remains of the fire long enough to get burnt, and then she got up and meekly allowed Withers to throw a tarpaulin and a roll of blankets over her and tie them fast. Lake and Withers were sweating freely when this job was finished. "'Say, is that a usual morning's task with the pack animals?' asked Shefford. "'They're all pretty decent today, except Dynamite,' replied Withers. "'She's got to be worked out.' Shefford felt both amusement and consternation. The sun was just rising over the ramparts of the canyon, and he had already seen more difficult and dangerous work accomplished than half a dozen men of his type could do in a whole day. He liked the outlook of his new duty as Withers' assistant, but he felt helplessly inefficient. Still, all he needed was experience. He passed over what he anticipated would be pain and peril. The cost was of no moment. Soon the pack train was on the move, with the Indian leading. This morning, Nack Yaw began his strange swinging off to the left, precisely as he had done the day before. It got to be annoying to Shefford, and he lost patience with the Mustang and jerked him sharply round. This, however, had no great effect on Nack Yaw. As the train headed straight up the canyon, Joe Lake dropped back to ride beside Shefford. The Mormon had been amiable and friendly. "'Flock of deer up that draw,' he said, pointing up a narrow side canyon. Shefford gazed to see half a dozen small brown, long-eared objects, very like burrows, watching the pack train pass. "'Are they deer?' he asked delightedly. "'Sure are,' replied Joe, sincerely. "'Get down and shoot one. There's a rifle in your saddle, sheep.' Shefford had already discovered that he had been armed this morning, a matter which had caused him reflection. These animals certainly looked like deer. He had seen a few deer, though not in their native wild haunts, and he experienced the thrill of the hunter. Dismounting, he drew the rifle out of the sheath and started toward the little canyon. "'Higher! Where are you going with that gun?' yelled Withers. "'That's a bunch of burrows. Joe's up to his old tricks. Shefford, look out for Joe.' Rather sheepishly, Shefford returned to his mustang and sheathed the rifle, and then took a long look at the animals up the draw. They resembled deer, but upon second glance they surely were burrows. "'Dern me! Now if I didn't think they sure were deer!' exclaimed Joe. He appeared absolutely sincere and innocent. Shefford hardly knew how to take this likable Mormon, but vowed he would be on his guard in the future. Nas Te Bega soon led the pack train toward the left wall of the canyon, and evidently intended to scale it. Shefford could not see any trail, and the wall appeared steep and insurmountable. But upon nearing the cliff, he saw a narrow, broken trail leading zigzag up over smooth rock, weathered slope, and through cracks. Spread out and careful now, yelled Withers. The need of both advices soon became manifest to Shefford. The burrows started stones rolling, making danger for those below. Shefford dismounted and led Nack Yaw and turned aside many a rolling rock. The Indian and the burrows, with the red mule leading, climbed steadily, but the Mustangs had trouble. Joe's spirited bay had to be coaxed to face the ascent. Nack Yaw balked at every difficult step, and Dynamite slipped on a flat slant of rock and slid down forty feet. Withers and Lake with ropes hauled the mare out of the dangerous position. Shefford, who brought up the rear, saw all the action, and it was exciting, but his pleasure in the climb was spoiled by the sight of blood and hair on the stones. The ascent was crooked, steep, and long, and when Shefford reached the top of the wall, he was glad to rest. 
It made him gasp to look down and see what he had surmounted. The canyon floor, green and level, lay a thousand feet below, and the wild burrows, which had followed on the trail, looked like rabbits. Shefford mounted presently and rode out upon a wide, smooth trail leading into a cedar forest. There were bunches of gray sage in the open places. The air was cool and crisp, laden with sweet fragrance. He saw a lake and withers bobbing along, now on one side of the trail, now on the other, and they kept to a steady trot. Occasionally, the Indian and his bright red saddle blanket showed in an opening of the cedars. It was level country, and there was nothing for Shepherd to see except cedar and sage, an outcropping of red rock in places, and the winding trail. Mockingbirds made melody everywhere. Shefford seemed full of a strange pleasure, and the hours flew by. Nack yaw still wanted to be everlastingly turning off the trail, and moreover, now he wanted to go faster. He was eager, restless, dissatisfied. At noon the pack train descended into a deep draw, well covered with cedar and sage. There was plenty of grass and shade, but no water. Shefford was surprised to see that every pack was removed. However, the roll of blankets was left on dynamite. The men made a fire and began to cook a noonday meal. Shefford, tired and warm, sat in a shady spot and watched. He had become all eyes. He had almost forgotten Fay Larkin. He had forgotten his trouble, and the present seemed sweet and full. Presently, his ears were filled by a pattering roar and looking up the draw, saw two streams of sheep and goats coming down. Soon an Indian shepherd appeared, riding a fine mustang. A cream-colored colt bounded along behind, and presently a shaggy dog came in sight. The Indian dismounted at the camp, and his flock spread by in two white and black streams. The dog went with them. Withers and Joe shook hands with the Indian whom Joe called Navvy, and Shefford lost no time in doing likewise. Then Nas Te Bega came in, and he and the Navajo talked. When the meal was ready, all of them sat down round the canvas. The Shepherd did not tie his horse. Presently, Shefford noticed that Nack Yaw had returned to camp, and was acting strangely. Evidently, he was attracted by the Indian's mustang or the cream-colored colt, at any rate, Nack Yaw hung around, tossed his head, whinnied in a low, nervous manner, and looked strangely eager and wild. Shefford was at first amused, then curious. Nack Yaw approached too close to the mother of the colt, and she gave him a sounding kick in the ribs. Nack Yaw uttered a plaintive snort and backed away to stand, crestfallen, with all his eagerness and fire vanished. Nesta Bega pointed to the mustang, and said something in his own tongue. Then Withers addressed the visiting Indian, and they exchanged some words, whereupon the trader turned to Shefford. I bought Nack Yaw from this Indian three years ago. This mare is Nack Yaw's mother. He was born over here to the south. That's why he always swung left off the trail. He wanted to go home. Just now he recognized his mother, and she wailed away and gave him a whack for his pains. She's got a colt now, and probably didn't recognize Nack Yaw. But he's broken-hearted. The trader laughed, and Joe said, You can't tell what these darn mustangs will do. Shefford felt sorry for Nack Yaw, and when it came time to saddle him, again found him easier to handle than ever before. Nack Yaw stood with head down, broken-spirited. Shefford was the first to ride up out of the draw, and once upon the top of the ridge he halted to gaze, wide-eyed and entranced. A rolling, endless plain sloped down beneath him and led him on to a distant, round-topped mountain. To the right a red canyon opened its jagged jaws, and away to the north rose a world and strange sea of curved ridges, crags, and domes. Nas Te Bega rode up then, leading the pack train. By nigh, that is Nas Tisan, he said, 
pointing to the mountain. Navajo Mountain. And there in the north are the canyon. Shefford followed the Indian down the trail and soon lost sight of that wide, green and red wilderness. Nas Te Bega turned at an intersecting trail, rode down into the canyon, and climbed out on the other side. Shefford got a glimpse now and then of the black dome of the mountain, but for the most part the distant points of the country were hidden. They crossed many trails, went up and down the sides of many shallow canyons. Troops of wild mustangs whistled at them, stood on ridgetops to watch, and then dashed away with manes and tails flying. Withers rode forward presently and halted the pack train. He had some conversation with Nas Te Bega, whereupon the Indian turned his horse and trotted back to disappear in the cedars. I'm some worried, explained Withers. Joe thinks he saw a bunch of horsemen trailing us. My eyes are bad, and I can't see far. The Indian will find out. I took a roundabout way to reach the village, because I'm always dodging Shad. This communication lent an added zest to the journey. Shefford could hardly believe the truth that his eyes and his ears brought to his consciousness. He turned in behind Withers and rode down the rough trail, helping the Mustang all in his power. It occurred to him that Nak Yaw had been entirely different since that meeting with his mother in the draw. He turned no more off the trail. He answered readily to the rain. He did not look afar from every ridge. Shefford conceived a liking for the Mustang. Withers turned aside in his saddle and let his Mustang pick the way. Another time we'll go up round the base of the mountain where you can look down on the grandest scene in the world, said he, two hundred miles of wind-worn rock, all smooth and bare, without a single straight line, canyon, caves, bridges, the most wonderful country in the world. Even the Indians haven't explored it. It's haunted for them, and they have strange gods. The Navajos will hunt on this side of the mountain, but not on the other. That north side is consecrated ground. My wife, has long been trying to get the Navajos to tell her the secret of Nanesoshi. Nanesoshi means Rainbow Bridge. The Indians worship it, but as far as she can find out, only a few have ever seen it. I imagine it'd be worth some trouble. Maybe that's the bridge Venters talked about, the one overarching the entrance to Surprise Valley, said Shefford. It might be, replied the trader. You've got a good chance of finding out. Nas Te Bega is the man. You stick to that Indian. Well, we'll start down here into this canyon. And we go down some, I reckon. In a half hour, you'll see sago lilies, an Indian paintbrush, and vermilion cactus. About the middle of the afternoon, the pack train and its drivers arrived at the hidden Mormon village. Nas Te Bega had not returned from his scout back along the trail. Shefford's sensibilities had all been overstrained, but he had left in him enthusiasm and appreciation that made the situation of this village a fairyland. It was a valley, a canyon floor, so long that he could not see the end, and perhaps a quarter of a mile wide. The air was hot, still, and sweetly odorous of unfamiliar flowers. Pinion and cedar trees surrounded the log and stone houses, and along the walls of the canyon stood sharp-pointed dark green spruce trees. These walls were singular of shape and color. They were not imposing in height, but they waved like the long, undulating swell of a sea. Every foot of surface was perfectly smooth, and the long curved lines of darker tinge that streaked the red followed the rounded line of the slope at the top. Far above, yet overhanging, were great yellow crags and peaks, and between these, still higher, showed the pine-fringed slope of Navajo Mountain, with snow in the sheltered places and glistening streams like silver threads running down. All this Shefford noticed as he entered the valley from round a corner of wall. Upon nearer view he saw and heard a host of children, 
who, looking up to see the intruders, scattered like frightened quail. Long gray grass covered the ground, and here and there wide, smooth paths had been worn. A swift and murmuring brook ran through the middle of the valley, and its banks were bordered with flowers. Withers led the way to one side near the wall, where a clump of cedar trees and a dark, swift spring, boiling out of the rocks and banks of amber moss with purple blossoms, made a beautiful campsite. Here the mustangs were unsaddled and turned loose without hobbles. It was certainly unlikely that they would leave such a spot. Some of the burrows were unpacked, and the others, Withers drove off into the village. Sure's pretty nice, said Joe, wiping his sweaty face. I never want to leave. It suits me to lie on this moss. Take a drink of that spring. Shefford complied with alacrity and found the water cool and sweet and he seemed to feel it all through him. Then he returned to the mossy bank. He did not reply to Joe. In fact, all his faculties were absorbed in watching and feeling, and he lay there long after Joe went off to the village. The murmur of water, the hum of bees, the song of strange birds, the sweet warm air, the dreamy summer somnolence of the valley, all these added drowsiness to Shefford's weary lassitude, and he fell asleep. When he awoke, Nas Te Bega was sitting near him, and Joe was busy near a campfire. "'Hello, Nas Te Bega,' said Shefford. "'Was there anyone trailing us?' The Navajo nodded. Joe raised his head, and with forceful brevity said, "'Shad?' "'Shad,' echoed Shefford, remembering the dark, sinister face of his visitor that night in the Sagi. Joe, is it serious? His trailing us? Well, I don't know how darn serious it is, but I'm scared to death, replied Lake. He and his gang will hold us up somewhere on the way home. Shefford regarded Joe with both concern and doubt. Joe's words were at variance with his looks. Say, pard, can you shoot a rifle? queried Joe. Yes, I'm a fair shot at targets. The Mormon nodded his head as if pleased. That's good. These outlaws are all poor shots with a rifle. So am I. But I can handle a six-shooter. I reckon we'll make Shad sweat if he pushes us. Withers returned, driving the burrows, all of which had been unpacked down to the saddles. Two gray-bearded men accompanied him. One of them appeared to be very old and venerable, and walked with a stick. The other had a sad lined face and kind mild blue eyes. Shefford observed that Lake seemed unusually respectful. Withers introduced these Mormons merely as Smith and Henninger. They were very cordial and pleasant in their greetings to Shefford. Presently, another, somewhat younger man joined the group, a stalwart, jovial fellow with ruddy face. There was certainly no mistaking his kindly welcome as he shook Shefford's hand. His name was Beale. The three stood around the campfire for a while, evidently glad of the presence of fellow men, and to hear news from the outside. Finally, they went away, taking Joe with them. Withers took up the task of getting supper where Joe had been made to leave it. Shefford, listen, he said presently, as he knelt before the fire. I told them right out that you'd been a Gentile clergyman that you'd gone back on your religion. It impressed them, and you've been well received. I'll tell the same thing over at Stonebridge. You'll get in right. Of course, I don't expect they'll make a Mormon out of you, but they will try to. Meanwhile, you can be square and friendly all the time. You're trying to find your Fay Larkin. Tomorrow, you'll meet some of the women. They're good souls, but like any women, crazy for news. Think what it is to be shut up in here, between these walls. Withers, I'm intensely interested, replied Shefford, and excited, too. Shall we stay here long? I'll stay a couple of days, then go to Stonebridge with Joe. He'll come back here, and when you both feel like leaving, and if Neste Bega thinks it's safe, you'll take a trail over to some Indian Hogan's and pack me out a load of skins and blankets. My boy, 
You've all the time there is, and I wish you luck. This isn't a bad place to loaf. I always get sentimental over here. Maybe it's the women. Some of them are pretty, and one of them, Shefford, they call her Sago Lily. Her first name is Mary. I'm told. Don't know her last name. She's lovely. And I bet you forget Fay Larkin in a flash. Only be careful. You drop in here with peculiar credentials, so to speak as my helper and as a man with no religion. You'll not only be fully trusted, but you'll be welcome to these lonely women. So be careful. Remember, it's my secret belief that they are sealed wives and are visited occasionally at night by their husbands. I don't know this, but I believe it, and you're not supposed to dream of that. How many men in the village? asked Shefford. Three. You met them. Have they wives? asked Shefford curiously. Wives, well, I guess, but only one each that I know of. Joe Lake is the only unmarried Mormon I've met. And no men, strangers, cowboys, outlaws ever come to this village? Except the Indians, it seems to be a secret so far, replied the trader earnestly, but it can't be kept secret. I've said that time after time over in Stonebridge. With Mormons, it's sufficient until the day is the evil thereof. What happens when outsiders do learn and ride in here? There'll be trouble, maybe bloodshed. Mormon women are absolutely good, but they're human, and want and need a little life. And strange to say, Mormon men are pig-headedly jealous. Why, if some of the cowboys I know in Durango would ride over here, there'd simply be hell. But that's a long way, and probably this village will be deserted before news of it ever reaches Colorado. There's more danger of Shad and his gang coming in. Shad's half Paiute. He must know of this place, and he's got some white outlaws in his gang. Come on, grub's ready, and I'm too hungry to talk. Later, when shadows began to gather in the valley, and the lofty peaks above were gold in the sunset glow, Withers left camp to look after the strained mustangs, and Shefford strolled to and fro under the cedars. The lights and shades in the sagi that first night had moved him to enthusiastic watchfulness, but here they were so weird and beautiful that he was enraptured. He actually saw great shafts of gold and shadows of purple streaming from the peaks down into the valley. It was day on the heights and twilight in the valley. The swiftly changing colors were like rainbows. While he strode up and down, several women came to the spring and filled their buckets. They wore shawls or hoods, and their garments were somber, but nevertheless they appeared to have youth and comeliness. They saw him, looked at him curiously, and then, without speaking, went back on the well-trodden path. Presently down the path appeared a woman, a girl in lighter garb. It was almost white. She was shapely and walked with free, graceful step, reminding him of the Indian girl, Glen Naspa. This one wore a hood, shaped like a huge sunbonnet, and it concealed her face. She carried a bucket. When she reached the spring and went down the few stone steps, Shefford saw that she did not have on shoes. As she braced herself to lift the bucket, her bare foot clung to the mossy stone. It was a strong, sinewy, beautiful foot, instinct with youth. He was curious enough, he thought, but the awakening artist in him made him more so. She dragged at the full bucket and had difficulty in lifting it out of the hole. Shefford strolled forward and took the bucket handle from her. "'Won't you let me help?' he said, lifting the bucket. "'Indeed, it's very heavy.' "'Oh, thank you,' she said, without raising her head. Her voice seemed singularly young and sweet. He had not heard a voice like it. She moved down the path, and he walked beside her. He felt embarrassed, yet more curious than ever. He wanted to say something, to turn and look at her, but he kept on for a dozen paces, without making up his mind. Finally, he said, Do you really carry this heavy bucket? Why, it makes my arm ache. Twice every day, morning and evening, she replied, I'm very strong. Then he stole a look out of the corner of his eye, and seeing 
that her face was hidden from him by the hood, he turned to observe her at better advantage. A long braid of hair hung down her back. In the twilight it gleamed dull gold. She came up to his shoulder. The sleeve nearest him was rolled up to her elbow, revealing a fine round arm. Her hand, like her foot, was brown, strong, and well-shaped. It was a hand that had been developed by labor. She was full-bosomed, yet slender, and she walked with a free stride that made Shefford admire and wonder. They passed several of the little stone and log houses, and women greeted them as they went by, and children peered shyly from the doors. He kept trying to think of something to say, and failing in that, determined to have one good look under the hood before he left her. "'You walk lame,' she said solicitously. "'Let me carry the bucket now, please. My house is near.' "'Am I lame? Guess so a little,' he replied. "'It was a hard ride for me, but I'll carry the bucket just the same.' They went on, under some pinion trees, down a path to a little house identical with the others, except that it had a stone porch. Shefford smelled fragrant wood smoke and saw a column curling from the low, flat, stone chimney. Then he set the bucket down on the porch. "'Thank you, Mr. Shefford,' she said. "'You know my name?' he asked. "'Yes, Mr. Withers spoke to my nearest neighbor, and she told me.' "'Ah, I see. And you?' He did not go on, and she did not reply. When she stepped upon the porch and turned, he was able to see under the hood. The face there was in shadow, and for that very reason he answered to ungovernable impulse and took a step closer to her. Dark, grave, sad eyes looked down at him, and he felt as if he could never draw his own glance away. He seemed not to see the rest of her face, and yet felt that it was lovely. Then a downward movement of the hood hid from him the strange eyes and the shadowy loveliness. I, I beg your pardon, he said quickly, drawing back. I'm rude. Withers told me about a girl, he called. He said looked like a sago lily. That's no excuse to stare under your hood. But I, I was curious. I wondered if... He hesitated, realizing how foolish his talk was. She stood a moment, probably watching him. But he could not be sure, for her face was hidden. They call me that, she said, but my name is Mary. Mary? What? he asked. Just Mary, she said simply. Good night. He did not say good night and could not have told why. She took up the bucket and went into the dark house. Shefford hurried away into the gathering darkness. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Hidden Valley, Shefford had hardly seen her face yet. He was more interested in a woman than he had ever been before. Still, he reflected, as he returned to camp, he had been under a long strain. He was unduly excited by this new and adventurous life, and these, with the mystery of this village were perhaps accountable for a state of mind that could not last. He rolled in his blankets on the soft bed of moss, and he saw the stars through the needle-like fringe of the pinions. It seemed impossible to fall asleep. The two domed peaks split the sky, and back of them, looming dark and shadowy, rose the mountain. There was something cold, austere, and majestic in their lofty presence, and they made him feel alone yet not alone. He raised himself to see the quiet forms of Withers and Nas Te Bega prone in the starlight, and their slow deep breathing was that of tired men. A bell on a mustang rang somewhere off in the valley, and gave out a low, strange, reverberating echo from wall to wall. When it ceased, a silence set in that was deader than any silence he had ever felt, but gradually he became aware of the low murmur of the brook. For the rest, there was no sound of wind, no bark of dog or yelp of coyote, 
and no sound of voice in the village. He tried to sleep, but instead thought of this girl, who was called the Sago Lily. He recalled everything incident to their meeting, and the walk to her home, her swift, free step, her graceful poise, her shapely form, the long braid of hair, dull gold, in the twilight, the beautiful bare foot, and the strong round arm. These he thought of and recalled vividly. But of her face he had no idea except the shadowy, haunting loveliness, and that grew more and more difficult to remember. The tone of her voice and what she had said, how the one had thrilled him and the other mystified. It was her voice that had most attracted him. There was something in it besides music. What? He could not tell. Sadness? Depth? Something like that in Nas Te Bega's beauty springing from disuse. But this seemed absurd. Why should he imagine her voice, one that had not been used as freely as any other woman's? She was a Mormon, very likely, almost surely. She was a sealed wife. His interest, too, was absurd, and he tried to throw it off or imagine it, one he might have felt in any other of these strange women of the hidden village. But Shefford's intelligence and his good sense, which became operative when he was fully roused, and set the situation clearly before his eyes, had no effect upon his deeper, mystic, and primitive feelings. He saw the truth, and he felt something that he could not name. He would not be a fool, but there was no harm in dreaming, and unquestionably, beyond all doubt, the dream and the romance that had lured him to the wilderness were here, hanging over him like the shadows of the great peaks. His heart swelled with emotion when he thought of how the black and incessant despair of the past was gone. So he embraced any attraction that made him forget and think and feel. Some instinct, stronger than intelligence, bade him drift. Joe's rolling voice awoke him the next morning, and he rose with a singular zest. When or where in his life had he awakened in such a beautiful place? Almost he understood why Venters and Bess had been haunted by memories of Surprise Valley. The morning was clear, cool, sweet. The peaks were dim and soft in rosy cloud. Shafts of golden sunlight shot down into the purple shadows. Mockingbirds were singing. His body was sore and tired from the unaccustomed travel, but his heart was full, happy. His spirit wanted to run, and he knew there was something out there waiting to meet it. The Indian and the trader and the Mormon all meant more to him this morning. He had grown a little overnight. Nas Te Bega's deep, by nigh, rang in his ears, and the smiles of Withers and Joe were greetings. He had friends, he had work, and there was rich, strange, and helpful life to live. There was even a difference in the Mustang, Nakyal. He came readily. He did not look wild. He had a friendly eye, and Shefford liked him more. "'What is there to do?' asked Shefford feeling equal to a hundred tasks. No work, replied the trader with a laugh, and he drew Shefford aside. I'm in no hurry. I like it here, and Joe never wants to leave. Today you can meet the women. Make yourself popular. I've already made you that. These women are mostly all young and lonesome. Talk to them. Make them like you. Then some day you may be safe to ask questions. Last night, I wanted to ask old Mother Smith if she ever heard the name Fay Larkin, but I thought better of it. If there is a girl here or at Stonebridge of that name, we'll learn it. If there is mystery, we'd better go slow. Mormons are hell on secret and mystery, and to pry into their affairs is to queer yourself. My advice is, just be as nice as you can be and let things happen. Fay Larkin. All in a night, Shefford had forgotten her. Why? He pondered over the matter, and then the old thrill, the old desire, came back. Shefford, what do you think Nas Te Bega said to me last night? asked Withers in a lower voice. Haven't any idea, replied Shefford, curiously. We were sitting beside the fire. I saw you walking under the cedars. You seemed thoughtful. 
That keen Indian watched you, and he said to me in Navajo, By Nye has lost his god. He has come to find a wife. Nas Bega is his brother. He meant he'll find both god and wife for you. I don't know about that. But I say take the Indian as he thinks he is, your brother. Long before I knew Nas Bega, my wife used to tell me about him. He's a sage and a poet, the very spirit of this desert. He's worth cultivating for his own sake. But more, remember, if Fay Larkin is still shut in that valley, this Navajo will find her for you. I shall take Nas Bega as my brother and be proud, replied Shefford. There's another thing. Do you intend to confide in Joe? I hadn't thought of that. Well, it might be a good plan, but wait until you know him better and he knows you. He's ready to fight for you now. He'll take your trouble to heart. You wouldn't think Joe is deeply religious, yet he is. He may never breathe a word about religion to you. Now, Shefford, go ahead. You've struck a trail. It's rough, but it'll make a man of you. It'll lead somewhere. I'm singularly fortunate. I, who had lost all friends. Withers, I am grateful. I'll prove it. I'll show. Withers' upheld hand checked further speech, and Shefford realized that beneath the rough exterior of this desert trader there was fine feeling. These men of crude toil and wild surroundings were beginning to loom up large in Shefford's mind. The day began leisurely. The men were yet at breakfast when the women of the village began to come one by one to the spring. Joe Lake made friendly and joking remarks to each and as each one passed on down the path, he poised a biscuit in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other, and with his head cocked sideways like an owl, he said, Reckon I've got to get me a woman like her. Shefford saw and heard, yet he was all the time half unconsciously watching with strange eagerness for a white figure to appear. At last he saw her, the same girl with the hood, the same swift step. A little shock or quiver passed over him, and at the moment all that was explicable about it was something associated with regret. Joe Lake whistled and stared. I haven't met her, he muttered. That's the Sago Lily, said Withers. Reckon I'm going to carry that bucket, went on Joe. And queer yourself with all the other women who's been to the spring? Don't do it, Joe, advised the trader. But her bucket's bigger, protested Joe weakly. That's true, but you ought to know Mormons. If she'd come first, all right, and she didn't. Why, don't single her out. Joe kept his seat. The girl came to the spring. A low good morning came from under the hood. Then she filled her bucket and started home. Shefford observed that this time she wore moccasins, and she carried the heavy bucket with ease. When she disappeared, he had again the vague, inexplicable sensation of regret. Joe Lake breathed heavily. Reckon I've got to get me a woman like her, he said. But the form of jocose tone was lacking, and he appeared thoughtful. Withers first took Shefford to the building used for a school. It was somewhat larger than the other houses, had only one room with two doors and several windows. It was full of children of all sizes and ages sitting on rude board benches. There were half a hundred of them, sturdy, healthy, rosy boys and girls, clad in homemade garments. The young woman teacher was as embarrassed as her pupils were shy, and the visitors withdrew without having heard a word of lesson. Withers then called upon Smith, Henniger, and Beale and their wives. Shefford found himself cordially received, and what little he did say showed him how he would be listened to when he cared to talk. These folks were plain and kindly, and he found that there was nothing about them to dislike. The men appeared mild and quiet, and when not conversing, seemed austere. The repose of the women was only on the surface. Underneath, he felt their intensity, especially in many of the younger women, whom he met in the succeeding hour, did he feel this power of restrained emotion. This surprised him, as did also the fact that almost every one of them was attractive, and some of them were exceedingly pretty. 
he became so interested in them, all as a whole, that he could not individualize one. They were as widely different in appearance and temperament as women of any other class, but it seemed to Shefford that one common trait united them, and it was a strange, checked yearning for something that he could not discover. Was it happiness? They certainly seemed to be happy, far more than those millions of women who were chasing phantoms. Were they really sealed wives, as Withers believed? And was this unnatural wifehood responsible for the strange intensity? At any rate, he returned to camp with the conviction that he had stumbled upon a remarkable situation. He had been told the last names of only three women, and their husbands were in the village. The names of the others were Ruth, Rebecca, Joan. He could not recall them all. They were the mothers of these beautiful children. The fathers, as far as he was concerned, were as intangible as myths. Shefford was an educated clergyman, a man of the world, and as such, knew women in his way. Mormons might be strange and different, yet the fundamental truth was that all over the world mothers of children were wives. There was a relation between wife and mother that did not need to be named to be felt. And he divined from this, whatever the situation of these lonely and hidden women, they knew themselves to be wives. Shefford absolutely satisfied himself on that score. If they were miserable, they certainly did not show it. And the question came to him, how just was the criticism of uninformed men? His judgment of Mormons had been established by what he had heard and read, rather than what he knew. He wanted now to have an open mind. He had studied the totism and exogamy of the primitive races, and here was his opportunity to understand polygamy. One wife for one man, that was the law. Mormons broke it openly. Gentiles broke it secretly. Mormons acknowledged all their wives and protected their children. Gentiles acknowledged one wife only. Unquestionably, the Mormons were wrong. But were not the Gentiles still more wrong? The following day Joe Lake appeared reluctant to start for Stonebridge with Withers. Joe, you'd better come along, said the trader dryly. I reckon you've seen a little too much of the Sago Lily. Lake offered no reply, but it was evident from his sober face that Withers had not hit short of the mark. Withers rode off with a parting word to Shefford, and finally Joe somberly mounted his bay and trotted down the valley. As Nes Bega had gone off somewhere to visit Indians, Shefford was left alone. He went into the village and made himself useful and agreeable. He made friends with the children, and he talked to the women until he was hoarse. Their ignorance of the world was a spur to him, and never in his life had he had such an attentive audience. And as he showed no curiosity, asked no difficult questions, gradually what reserve he had noted wore away, and the end of the day saw him on a footing with them that Withers had predicted. By the time several days had passed, it seemed from the interest and friendliness of these women that he might have lived long among them. He was possessed of wit and eloquence and information which he freely gave and not with selfish motive. He liked these women. He liked to see the somber shade pass from their faces, to see them brighten. He had met the girl Mary at the spring and along the path, but he had not yet seen her face. He was always looking for her, hoping to meet her, and confessed to himself that the best of the day for him were the morning and the evening visits she made to the spring. Nevertheless, for some reason hard to divine, he was reluctant to seek her deliberately. Always while he had listened to her neighbors talk, he had hoped they might let fall something about her, but they did not. He received an impression that she was not so intimate with the others as he had supposed. They all made one big family. Still, she seemed a little outside. He could bring no proofs to strengthen this idea. He merely felt it, and many of his feelings were independent of intelligent reason. Something had been added to curiosity, that was sure. It was his habit to call upon Mother Smith in the afternoons. From the first, her talk to him hinted of a leaning toward thought 
of making him a Mormon. Her husband and the other men took up her cue and spoke of their religion, casually at first, but gradually opening their minds to free and simple discussion of their faith. Shefford lent respectful attention. He would rather have been a Mormon than an atheist, and apparently they considered him the latter, and were earnest to save his soul. Shefford knew that he could never be one any more than the other. He was just at sea. But he listened, and he found them simple in faith, blind perhaps, but loyal and good. It was noteworthy that Mother Smith happened to be the only woman in the village who had ever mentioned religion to him. She was old, of a past generation. The young women belonged to the present. Shefford pondered the significant difference. Every day made more steadfast his impression of the great mystery that was like a twining shadow round these women. Yet in the same time many little ideas shifted and many new characteristics became manifest. This last was, of course, the result of acquaintance. He was learning more about the villagers. He gathered from keen interpretation of subtle words and looks that here in this lonely village, the same as in all the rest of the world where women were together, there were cliques, quarrels, dislikes, loves, and jealousies. The truth once known to him made him feel natural and fortified his confidence to meet the demands of an increasingly interesting position. He discovered, with somewhat grim amusement, that a clergyman's experience in a church full of women had not been entirely useless. One afternoon he let fall a careless remark that was a subtle question in regard to the girl Mary, whom Withers called the Sago Lily. In response, he received an answer couched in the sweet poisoned honey of women's jealousy. He said no more. Certain ideas of his were strengthened, and straight away he became thoughtful. That afternoon late, as he did his camp chores, he watched for her. But she did not come. Then he decided to go see her. But even the decision and the strange thrill it imparted did not change his reluctance. Twilight was darkening the valley when he reached her house, and the shadows were thick under the pinions. There was no light in the door or window. He saw a white shape on the porch, and as he came down the path it rose. It was the girl Mary, and she appeared startled. "'Good evening,' he said. "'It's Shefford. May I stay and talk a little while?' She was silent for so long that he began to feel awkward. "'I'd be glad to have you,' she replied finally. There was a bench on the porch, but he preferred to sit upon a blanket on the step. "'I've been getting acquainted with everybody except you,' he went on. "'I have been here,' she replied. That might have been a woman's speech, but it certainly had been made in a girl's voice. She was neither shy nor embarrassed nor self-conscious. As she stood back from him, he could not see her face in the dense twilight. "'I've been wanting to call on you.' She made some slight movement. Shefford felt a strange calm, yet he knew the moment was big and potent. "'Won't you sit here?' he asked. She complied with his wish, and then he saw her face, though dimly, in the twilight, and it struck him mute. But he had no glimpse such as flashed upon him from under her hood the other night. He thought of a white flower in shadow, and received his first impression of the rare and perfect lily, Withers had said, graced the wild canyon. She was only a girl. She sat very still, looking straight before her, and seemed to be waiting, listening. Shefford saw the quick rise and fall of her bosom. "'I want to talk,' he began, swiftly, hoping to put her at ease. "'Everyone here has been good to me, and I've talked, oh, for hours and hours. But the thing in my mind I haven't spoken of. I've never asked any questions. That makes my part so strange. I want to tell why I came out here. I need someone who will keep my secret, and perhaps help me. Would you?' "'Yes, if I could,' she replied. "'You see, I've got to trust you, or one of these other women. You're all Mormons. I don't mean that's anything against you. I believe you're all good and noble. But the fact makes 
What makes a liberty of speech impossible? What can I do? Her silence probably meant that she did not know. Shefford sensed less strain in her and more excitement. He believed he was on the right track and did not regret his impulse. Even had he regretted it, he would have gone on, for opposed to caution and intelligence was his driving mystic force. Then he told her the truth about his boyhood, his ambition to be an artist, his renunciation to his father's hope, his career as a clergyman, his failure in religion, and the disgrace that had made him a wanderer. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. The faint starlight shone on her face, in her eyes, and if he ever saw beauty and soul, he saw them then. She seemed deeply moved. She had forgotten herself. She betrayed girlhood then, all the quick sympathy, the wonder, the sweetness of a heart, innocent and untutored. She looked at him with great, starry, questioning eyes, as if they had just become aware of his presence, as if a man had been strange to her. Thank you. It's good of you to be sorry, he said. My instinct guided me right. Perhaps you'll be my friend. I will be if I can, she said. But can you be? I don't know. I've never had a friend. I... But, sir, I mustn't talk of myself. Oh, I'm afraid I can't help you. How strange the pathos of her voice. Almost he believed she was in need of help or sympathy or love. But he could not wholly trust the judgment formed from observation of a class different from hers. Maybe you can help me. Let's see, he said. I don't seek to make you talk of yourself. But you're a human being, a girl, almost a woman. You're not dumb, but even a nun can talk. A nun? What is that? Well, a nun is a sister of mercy, a woman consecrated to God, who has renounced the world. In some ways, you Mormon women here resemble nuns. It is sacrifice that nails you in this lonely valley. You see how I talk? One word, one thought brings another, and I speak what perhaps should be unsaid, and it's hard because I feel I could unburden myself to you. Tell me what you want, she said. Shefford hesitated and became aware of the rapid pound of his heart. More than anything, he wanted to be fair to this girl. He saw that she was warming to his influence. Her shadowy eyes were fixed upon him. The starlight, growing brighter, shone on her golden hair and white face. I'll tell you presently, he said. I've trusted you. I'll trust you with all, but let me have my own time. This is so strange a thing, my wanting to confide in you. It's selfish, perhaps. I have my own axe to grind. I hope I won't wrong you. That's why I'm going to be perfectly frank. I might wait for days to get better acquainted. But the impulse is on me. I've been so interested in all you Mormon women. The fact, the meaning of this hidden village is so, so terrible to me. But that's none of my business. I have spent many afternoons and evenings with these women at different cottages. You do not mingle with them. They are lonely, but have no such loneliness as yours. I have passed here every night. No light, no sound. I can't help thinking. Don't censor me or be afraid or draw within yourself just because I must think. I may be all wrong, but I'm curious. I wonder about you. Who are you? Mary. Mary what? Maybe I really don't want to know. I came with selfish motive, and now I'd like to, to, what shall I say? Make your life a little less lonely, for the while I'm here. That's all. It needn't offend. And if you accept it, how much easier I can tell you my secret. You are a Mormon, and I, well, I'm only a wanderer in these wilds. But we might help each other. Have I made a mistake? No, no, she cried almost wildly. We can be friends then? You will trust me, help me? Yes, if I dare. Surely you may dare what the other women would. She was silent. And the wistfulness of her silence touched him. He felt contrition. He did not stop to analyze his own emotions. But he had an inkling that once this strange situation was ended, he would have food for reflection. 
What struck him most now was the girl's blanched face, the strong, nervous clasp of her hands, the visible tumult of her bosom. Excitement alone could not be accountable for this. He had not divined the cause for such agitation. He was puzzled, troubled, and drawn irresistibly. He had not said what he had planned to say. The moment had given birth to his speech, and it had flowed. What was guiding him? Mary, he said earnestly, tell me, have you mother, father, sister, brother? Something prompts me to ask that. All dead, gone, years ago, she answered. How old are you? Eighteen, I think. I'm not sure. You are lonely? His words were gentle and divining. Oh, God, she cried, lonely? Then, as a man in a dream, he beheld her weeping. There was in her the unconsciousness of a child, and the passion of a woman. He gazed out into the dark shadows, and up at the white stars, and then at the bowed head with its mass of glinting hair. But her agitation was no longer strange to him. A few gentle and kind words had proved her undoing. He knew then that whatever her life was, no kindness or sympathy entered it. Presently she recovered and sat as before, only whiter of face, it seemed, and with something tragic in her dark eyes. She was growing cold and still again, aloof, more like those other Mormon women. I understand, he said. I'm not sorry I spoke. I felt your trouble, whatever it is. Do not retreat into your cold shell, I beg of you. Let me trust you with my secret. He saw her shake out of the cold apathy. She wavered. He felt an inexplicable sweetness in the power his voice seemed to have upon her. She bowed her head in acquiescence, and Shefford began his story. Did she grow still like stone, or was that only his vivid imagination? He told her of Venters and Bess, of Lassiter and Jane, of little Fay Larkin, of the romance, and then the tragedy of Surprise Valley. So when my church disowned me, he concluded, I conceived the idea of wandering into the wilds of Utah to save Fay Larkin from that canyon prison. It grew to be the best and strongest desire of my life. I think, if I could save her, that it would save me. I never loved any girl. I can't say that I love Fay Larkin. How could I when I've never seen her? And she's only a dream girl, but I believe, if she were to become a reality, a flesh-and-blood girl, that I would love her. That was more than Shefford had ever confessed to anyone, and it stirred him to his depths. Mary bent her head on her hands in strange, stone-like rigidity. So here I am in the canyon country, he continued. Withers tells me it is a country of rainbows, both in the evanescent air and in the changeless stone. Always as a boy there had been for me some haunting promise, some treasure at the foot of the rainbow. I shall expect the curve of a rainbow to lead me down into Surprise Valley. A dreamer, you will call me, but I have had strange dreams come true. Mary, do you think this dream will come true? She was silent so long that he repeated his question. Only in heaven, she whispered. He took her reply strangely, and a chill crept over him. You think my plan to seek, to strive, to find... You think that idle, vain? I think it noble. Thank God I've met a man like you. Don't praise me, he exclaimed hastily. Only help me. Mary, will you answer a few little questions? I swear by my honor I'll never reveal what you tell me. I'll try. He moistened his lips. Why did she seem so strange, so far away? The hovering shadow made him nervous. Always he had been afraid of the dark. His mood now admitted of unreal fancies. "'Have you ever heard of Fay Larkin?' he asked, very low. "'Yes.' "'Was there only one Fay Larkin?' "'Only one.' "'Did you ever see her?' "'Yes,' came the faint reply. He was grateful. How she might be breaking a faith with creed or duty. He had not dared to hope so much. All his inner being trembled at the portent of his next query. He had not dreamed it would be so hard to put, 
or would affect him so powerfully. A warmth, a glow, a happiness pervaded his spirit, and the chill, the gloom were as if they had never been. Where is Fay Larkin now? he asked huskily. He bent over her, touched her, leaned close to catch her whisper. She is dead. Slowly, Shefford rose, with a sickening shock, and then, in bitter pain, he strode away into the starlight. End of Chapter 6 Part 1 of The Rainbow Trail by Zane Gray this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sago Lilies, Part One. The Indian returned to camp that night, and early the next day, which was Sunday, Withers rode in, accompanied by a stout, gray-bearded personage wearing a long black coat. Bishop Kane, this is my new man, John Shefford, said the trader. Shefford acknowledged the introduction with the respectful courtesy evidently in order, and found himself being studied intently by clear blue eyes. The bishop appeared old, dry, and absorbed in thought. He spoke quaintly, using in every speech some biblical word or phrase, and he had an air of authority. He asked Shefford to hear him preach at the morning service, and then he went off into the village. "'Guess he liked your looks,' remarked Withers. "'He certainly sized me up,' replied Shefford. "'Well, what could you expect? Sure, I never heard of a deal like this. A handsome young fellow left alone with a lot of pretty Mormon women. You'll understand when you learn to know Mormons. Bishop Kane's a square old chap, crazy on religion, maybe, but otherwise he's a good fellow. I made the best stand I could for you.' The Mormons over at Stonebridge were huffy because I hadn't consulted them before fetching you over here. If I had, of course, you'd never have gotten here. It was Joe Lake who made it all right with them. Joe's well thought of, and he certainly stood up for you. I owe him something then, replied Shefford. Hope my obligations don't grow beyond me. Did you leave Joe at Stonebridge? Yes, he wanted to stay. I had work there. That'll keep him a while. Shefford, we've got news of Shad, bad news. The half-breed's cutting up rough. His gang shot up some Paiutes over here across the line. Then he got run out of Durango a few weeks ago for murder. A posse of cowboys trailed him, but he slipped them. He's a fox. You know he was trailing us here. He left the trail, Nas Te Vegas said. I learned at Stonebridge that Shad is well disposed toward Mormons. It takes the Mormons to handle Indians. Shad knows of this village, and that's why he shunted off our trail. But he might hang down in the pass and wait for us. I think I'd better go back to Kayenta alone, across country. You stay here till Joe and the Indian think it's safe to leave. You'll be going up on the slope of Navajo to load a pack train, and from there it may be well to go down West Canyon to Red Lake and home over the divide, the way you came. Joel, decide what's best. You might as well buckle on a gun and get used to it. Sooner or later, you'll have to shoot your way through. Shefford did not respond with his usual enthusiasm, and the omission caused the traitor to scrutinize him closely. What's the matter, he queried. There's no light in your eye today. You look a little shady. I didn't rest well last night, replied Shefford. I'm depressed this morning, but I'll cheer up directly. Did you get along with the women? Very well, indeed, and I've enjoyed myself. It's a strange, beautiful place. Do you like the women? Yes. Have you seen much of the Sago Lily? No, I carried her bucket one night and saw her only once again. I've been with the other women most of the time. It's just as well you didn't run often in the Mary. Joe's sick over her. I never saw a girl with a face and form to equal hers. There's danger here for any man, Shefford, even for you who think you've turned your back on the world. Any of these Mormon women may fall in love with you. 
They can't love their husbands. That's how I figure it. Religion holds them, not love. And the peculiar thing is this. Their second, third, and fourth wives, all sealed. That means their husbands are old, have picked them out for youth and physical charms, have chosen the very opposite to their first wives, and then have hidden them here in this lonely hole. Did you ever imagine so terrible a thing? No, Withers, I did not. Maybe that's what depressed you. Anyway, my hunch is worth taking. Be as nice as you can, Shefford. Lord knows it would be good for these poor women if every last one of them fell in love with you. That won't hurt them so long as you keep your head, Savvy. Perhaps I seem rough and coarse to a man of your class. Well, that may be. But human nature is human nature. And in this strange and beautiful place you might love an Indian girl, let alone the Sago Lily. That's all. I sure feel better with that load off my conscience. Hope I don't offend. No, indeed, I thank you, Withers, replied Shefford, with his hand on the traitor's shoulder. You are right to caution me. I seem to be wild, thirsting for adventure, chasing a gleam. In these unstable days I can't answer for my heart, but I can for my honor. These unfortunate women are as safe with me as, as they are with you and Joe. Withers uttered a blunt laugh. See here, son, look things squarely in the eye. Men of violent, lonely, toilsome lives store up hunger for the love of women. Love of the strange woman, if you want to put it that way. It's nature. It seems all the beautiful young women in Utah are corralled in this valley. When I come over here, I feel natural, but I'm not happy. I'd like to make love to, to that flower-faced girl, and I'm not ashamed to own it. I've told Molly, my wife, and she understands. As for Joe, it's much harder for him. Joe's never had a wife or sweetheart. I tell you he's sick, and if I stay here a month, I'd be sick. Withers had spoken with fire in his eyes and a grim humor on his lips, with uncompromising, brutal truth. What he admitted was astounding to Shefford, but, once spoken, not at all strange. The traitor was a man who spoke his inmost thought, and what he said suddenly focused Shefford's mental vision clear and whole upon the appalling significance of the tragedy of those women, especially of the girl whose life was lonelier, sadder, darker than that of the others. Withers, trust me, replied Shefford. All right, make the best of a bad job, said the trader, and went off about his tasks. Shefford and Withers attended the morning service, which was held in the schoolhouse. Exclusive of the children, every inhabitant of the village was there. The women, except the few eldest, were dressed in white, and looked exceedingly well. Manifestly, they had bestowed care upon this Sabbath morning's toilet. One thing surely this dress occasion brought out, and it was evident that the Mormon women were not poor, whatever their misfortunes might be. Jewelry was not wanting, nor fine lace, and they all wore beautiful wild flowers of a kind unknown to Shefford. He received many a bright smile. He looked for Mary hoping to see her face for the first time in the daylight. But she sat far forward and did not turn. He saw her graceful white neck, the fine lines of her throat, and her colorless cheek. He recognized her, yet in the light she seemed a stranger. The service began with a short prayer and was followed by the singing of a hymn. Nowhere had Shefford heard better music or sweeter voices. How deeply they affected him! Had any man ever fallen into a stranger adventure than this? He had only to shut his eyes to believe it all a creation of his fancy. A square log cabin and its red mud between the chinks and a roof like an Indian hogan. The old bishop in his black coat, standing solemnly, his hand beating time to the tune. The few old women, dignified and stately, the many young women, fresh and handsome, lifting their voices. Shefford listened intently to the bishop's sermon. In some respects it was the best he had ever heard. In others it was impossible for an intelligent man to regard seriously. It was very long, 
lasting an hour and a half, and the parts that were helpful to Shefford came from the experience and wisdom of a man who had grown old in the desert. The physical things that had molded characters of iron, the obstacles that only strong, patient men could have overcome, the making of homes in a wilderness, showed the greatness of this alien band of Mormons. Shefford conceded greatness to them, but the strange religion, the narrowing down of the world to the soil of Utah, the intimations of prophets on earth who had direct converse with God, the austere, self-conscious omnipotence of this old bishop, these were matters that Shefford felt he must understand better, and see more favorably if he were not to consider them impossible. Immediately after the service, forgetting that his intention had been to get the long-waited-for look at Mary in the light of the sun, Shefford hurried back to camp and to a secluded spot among the cedars. Strikingly, it had come to him that the fault he had found in Gentile religion he now found in the Mormon religion. An old question returned to haunt him. Were all religions the same in blindness? As far as he could see, religion existed to uphold the founders of a church, a creed. The church, of his own kind, was a place where narrow men and women went to think of their own salvation. They did not go there to think of others. And now Shefford's keen mind saw something of Mormonism and found it wanting. Bishop Kane was a sincere, good, mistaken man. He believed what he preached but that would not stand logic. He taught blindness, and mostly it appeared to be directed at the women. Was there no religion divorced from power, no religion as good for one man as another, no religion in the spirit of brotherly love? Naste Begas, by nay, brother, that was love, if not religion, and perhaps the one and the other were the same. Shefford kept in mind an intention to ask Naste Bega what he thought of the Mormons. Later, when opportunity afforded, he did speak to the Indian. Nas Te Bega threw away his cigarette and made an impressive gesture that conveyed as much sorrow as scorn. The first Mormon said God spoke to him and told him to go to a certain place and dig. He went there and found the Book of Mormon. It said, Follow me. Marry many wives, go into the desert, and multiply. Send your sons out into the world, and bring us young women, many young women. And when the first Mormon became strong with many followers, he said again, Give to me part of your labor, of your cattle and sheep, of your silver, that I may build me great cathedrals for you to worship in. And I will commune with God, and make it right and good that you have more wives. That is Mormonism. Naste Bega, you mean the Mormons are a great and good people, blindly following a leader? Yes, and the leader builds for himself, not for them. That is not religion. He has no God but himself. They have no God. They are blind like the Mokis, who have the creeping growths on their eyes. They have no God they can see and hear and feel, who is with them day and night. It was late in the afternoon when Bishop Kane rode through the camp and halted on his way to speak to Shefford. He was kind and fatherly. Young man, are you open to faith? he questioned gravely. I think I am, replied Shefford, thankful he could answer readily. Then come into the fold. You are a lost sheep. Away on the desert I heard its cry. God bless you. Visit me when you ride the stone bridge. He flicked his horse with a cedar branch and trotted away beside the trader, and presently the green-choked neck of the valley hid them from view. Shefford could not have said that he was glad to be left behind, and yet neither was he sorry. That Sabbath evening, as he sat quietly with Neste Vega, watching the sunset, gilding the peaks, he was visited by three of the young Mormon women, Ruth, Joan, and Hester. They deliberately sought him and merrily led him off to the village and to the evening service of singing and prayer. Afterward, he was surrounded and made much of. He had been popular before, but
but this was different. When he thoughtfully wended his way campward under the quiet stars, he realized that the coming of Bishop Kane had made a subtle change in the women. That change was at first hard to define, but from every point by which he approached it, he came to the same conclusion. The bishop had not objected to his presence in the village. The women became natural, free, unrestrained. A dozen or twenty young and attractive women thrown much into companionship with one man. He might become a Mormon. The idea made him laugh. But upon reflection, it was not funny. It sobered him. What a situation! He felt instinctively that he ought to fly from this hidden valley. But he could not have done it, even if he had not been in the trader's employ. The thing was provokingly seductive. It was like an Arabian Nights tale. What could these strange, fatally bound women do? Would any one of them become involved in sweet toils such as were possible to him? He was no fool. Already eyes had flashed and lips had smiled. A thousand like thoughts whirled through his mind, and when he had calmed down somewhat, two things were not lost upon him an intricate, fascinating situation, with no end to its possibilities, threatened and attracted him, and the certainty that, whatever change the bishop had inaugurated, it had made these poor women happier. The latter fact weighed more with Shefford than fears for himself. His word was given to Withers. He would have felt just the same without having bound himself. Still, in the light of the trader's blunt philosophy, and of his own assurance that he was no fool, Shefford felt it incumbent upon him to accept a belief that there were situations no man could resist without an anchor. The ingenuity of man could not have devised a stranger, a more enticing, a more overpoweringly fatal situation, fatal in that it could not be left untried. Shefford gave in, clicked his teeth as he let himself go and suddenly he thought of her whom these bitter women called the Sago Lily. The regret that had been his returned with thought of her, the saddest disillusion of his life. The keenness disappointment, the strangest pain, would always be associated with her. He had meant to see her face for once, clear in the sunlight, so that he could always remember it, and then never go near her again. And now it came to him that if he did see much of her, these other women would find him like the stone wall in the valley. Folly, perhaps it was, but she would be safe, maybe happier. When he decided, it was certain that he trembled. Then he buried the memory of Fay Larkin. Next day Shepard threw himself with all the boy left in him into the work and play of the village. He helped the women and made games for the children and he talked or listened. In the early evening he called on Ruth, chatted a while, and went on to see Joan, and from her to another. When the valley became shrouded in darkness, he went unseen down the path to Mary's lonely home. She was there, a white shadow against the black. When she replied to his greeting, her voice seemed full, broken, eager to express something that would not come. She was happier to see him than she should have been, Shefford thought. He talked swiftly, eloquently, about whatever he believed would interest her. He stayed long, and finally left, not having seen her face except in pale starlight and shadow, and the strong clasp of her hand remained with him as he went away under the pinions. Days passed swiftly. Joe Lake did not return. The Indian rode in and out of camp, watered and guarded the pack burrows and the mustangs. Shefford grew strong and active. He made gardens for the women. He cut cords of firewood. He dammed the brook and made an irrigation ditch. He learned to love these fatherless children, and they loved him. In the afternoon there was leisure for him and for the women. He had no favorites, and let the occasion decide what he should do and with whom he should be. They had little parties at the cottages and picnics under the cedars. He rode up and down the valley with Ruth, 
who could ride a horse as no other girl he had ever seen. He climbed with Hester. He walked with Joan. Mostly, he contrived to include several at once in the little excursions, though it was not rare for him to be out alone with one. It was not a game he was playing. More and more, as he learned to know these young women, he liked them better. He pitied them. He was good for them. It shamed him, hurt him, somehow, to see how they tried to forget something when they were with him. Not improbably, a little of it was coquetry, as natural as a laugh to any pretty woman. But that was not what hurt him. It was to see Ruth or Rebecca, as the case might be, full of life and fun, thoroughly enjoying some jest or play, all of a sudden be strangely recalled from the wholesome pleasure of a girl to become a deep and somber woman. The crimes in the name of religion. How he thought of the blood and the ruin laid at the door of religion. He wondered if that were so with Nestabega's religion, and he meant to find out some day. The women he liked best, he imagined, the least religious, and they made less effort to attract him. Every night in the dark he went to Mary's home and sat with her on the porch. He never went inside. For all he knew, his visits were unknown to her neighbors. Still, it did not matter to him if they found out. To her, he could talk as he had never talked to anyone. She liberated all his thought and fancy. He filled her mind. As there had been a change in the other women, so was there in Mary, however, it had no relation to the bishop's visit. The time came when Shefford could not but see that she lived and dragged through the long day for the sake of those few hours in the shadow of the stars with him. She seldom spoke. She listened. Wonderful to him. Sometimes she laughed, and it seemed the sound was a ghost of childhood pleasure. When he stopped to consider that she might fall in love with him, he drove the thought from him when he realized that his folly had become sweet and that the sweetness imperiously drew him, he likewise cast off that thought. The present was enough, and if he had any treasure of mind and heart, he gave them to her. She never asked him to stay, but she showed that she wanted him to. That made it hard to go. Still, he never stayed late. The moment of parting was like a break. Her goodbye was sweet, low music. It lingered on his ear. It bade him come tomorrow night, and it sent him away into the valley to walk under the stars, a man fighting against himself. One night at a parting, as he tried to see her face, in the wan glow of a clouded moon, he said, I have been trying to find a sago lily. Have you never seen one? she asked. No. He meant to say something with a double meaning in reference to her face and the name of the flower. But her unconsciousness made him hold his tongue. She was wholly unlike the other women. I'll show you where the lilies grow, she said. When? Tomorrow, early in the afternoon. I'll come to the spring. Then I'll take you. End of chapter 7, part 1